um, are inverses. We want to be able to determine if a function has an inverse function. Uh, determine if a function has an inverse function. Find an inverse function algebraically and graphically. So we want to be able to do the algebra to get a new equation for that inverse, but we also want to remember that graphically an inverse is just a reflection through the line y equals x. Y equals x is that perfect diagonal for the first and third quadrant. And then prove algebraically that two functions are inverses of each other. That's a very cool process. And I know when you see the word prove, it means they were anxious, but it's not prove like you think of proof of geometry. It's an algebraic proof. Determine any domain restrictions on this. Well, they have been doing that all along. So um, what we'll do is we'll get to a point where we say, okay, the inverse of this is not going to be a function, but what can we do to do the same things we were doing yesterday, where we say, okay, I really need this. There's an app I need to do with this, so I need this to be a function. If we restrict the domain for some of these, that's going to happen. Determine any of those domain restrictions on the original and the inverse function is, is going to be key for us. You know, so we have to make sure that we're using the functions other than the inverse. So let's talk about inverses. So inverse relation. We'll start there. Remember, relation is anything that we could graph. There doesn't have to be anything special about it. It's just, just if you want to know an inverse of something that you graph, how do you get it? So the ordered, a, the ordered pair AB is in a relation if and only if BA is in the inverse relation. You switch the x and the y. And that's actually the first step for our algebraically solving to find an equation for the inverse. Switch the x and the y, and then solve for y. That's what we do. So the inverse relation is not very hard to get. If you know some points on your original relation, all you do is swap them off. That makes it pretty easy for anyone. x for y, y for x. So if we graph y equals x squared, which it's been a little while since we looked at that, but uh, back in exponential, you have memorized your table. You know, one, three, two, and one, zero, one. And you just squared those and got 9, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4. And that is not this because that is our parent function for parabolas. And usually you get to the point where we're going to use derivatives on the table because we know that it was symmetric with the y axis. And so it was like a big, big waste of time to even bother. But now it says a graph an inverse relation just by doing what we know happens with inverses. The x and the y swap. That's what happens. So instead of negative 3, 9, it's going to be 9, negative 3. Instead of negative 2, 4, it's going to be 4, negative 2. Instead of negative 1, 1, it'll be 1, negative 1. And we can just keep going with this. Nine negative three plus two plus two one two one negative one zero zero one one four two and nine negative three. That's it. So if they give you a graph and they say graph of the function, just find some good points on the original, swap them out, x for y, and then you'll have your inverse function. Don't overthink it, you know? Because like I said, a lot of times we'll, we'll think, oh, it's the reflection over the line, y equals x, and we'll sit there and try to go equal but opposite on the other side and all of that. Don't make it that bad. Just take some nice points and reverse the order of the x and the y. It is a reflection over the line, y equals x, if we time to do that, we would get this red graph right over here. But that's kind of petsy, you know, and we want to be efficient. 
with our use of time. So it's it's faster just to switch out those X and Ys. So now, does this pass the vertical line test? Y equals X squared. Yeah. So the original here is a function. How about the red one? No go. Major fail. So the question becomes. Can we know that in advance? I mean, pretty obviously with y equals x squared, we have a lot of experience with it, and we know it's a function when we start out. Is there some kind of test we could use on the blue one here that would tell us in advance that our inverse is not going to be a function when we're done? Do you remember it? Okay. It is. It's all written down in your notes. Yeah. The vertical line test is what we use to see if something's going to be a function. The horizontal line test is what we use when we want to see if its inverse will be a function. And our parabola is going to be a factor. So, I mean, anywhere that we draw a horizontal line, we're getting two points here in the horizontal line test. So, vertical line test to tell if a function itself, uh, or a, I guess I should say, a relation is a function. Um, but when we want to tell whether or not that inverse is going to be a function, then we need the horizontal line. But that's what this little light is for you. Yes, we can do this by horizontal line test. Definitely can know that in advance. So this says the inverse of a relation is a function if and only if each horizontal line intersects the graph of the original relation. That's what the horizontal line test is. It's looking, hey, that sounds a whole lot. Test of just a function and that's what we're doing. Because this one is for the inverses. So we change the method in the horizontal line test. So in your home, just like you see in this example here, they're going to ask us some questions about whether or not things are functions. Because again, our calculus can be done in terms of other functions. So we're, we're trying to make sure that. So the first thing we need to go through, and let's not worry about reading B right now, um, is part A. We want to know, are these relations functions? If they are, we're going to put a little A by it, because those are the functions. So this first one here, does that pass our vertical line test? So this one is, the original is, a function. How about number two here? Failing? Okay, so we'll just leave that one blank. Three? Fail in the vertical line test? How about four? That one's good? All right. So those originals are functions, the ones that we marked with A right there. But then we want to know, even if the original isn't a function, would its inverse be a function? And we'll mark that with B. So take a look at A. Think about the horizontal line test. Is this one going to have an inverse that's a function? Because what we know about this graph, in fact, we should recognize this as the reciprocal one, is that this is increasing. It's getting closer and closer to zero, but it's never quite going to get there. So it's not flat. It's never flat. How about number two? Will that have an inverse that is a function? It will. So even though it's not a function to begin with, it's going to pass that horizontal line test and then it will. How about our oval over there? Anything on that one. And then how about the last one? Is it passing? No, it's just going to. So just because you start with a relation and not a function, it doesn't mean that your inverse won't be a function. That's the point of all this. You really have to go through the testing to see whether or not this is going to work. Um, unless you learn to watch for one little thing. And that one little thing is going to have to do with the fact that we solve for y and y has a square root. So anytime our y values are going to have even powers, we're going to have a problem. We're not going to have an inverse that is a function. And that's why up here for y equals x squared, its inverse is not going to be a function. And it's x squared in this one, but when you think about it, the first step that we do when we want to find an inverse is we switch the x and the y. So it would look like that. 
and then we solve for y by taking the square root. And definitely that increases our answer. So start looking at this stuff algebraically because graphing, yeah, you know, it's all right, but we can tell whether or not something's going to be a function or not. But most of the time, we'd like to be able to just look at the equation and say, hey, is this a function? Is this tangent a function? Tell me what it So on the top of the next page, it says, a function whose inverse is a function has a graph that passes both the horizontal and vertical line tests. And that was that graph, that first graph that we looked at in example three. Such a function is called one, one, since every x is paired with one y, and every y is paired with three x. So here's another set of functions that we can do a lot of calculus with. And those are the one, one functions. Very special because every x could be one y and every y could be one x. And so that's a group of functions that we can do a lot with. Inverse function. If f is a one to one function with domain b and range r, then the inverse function of f, and I know it looks like f to the negative one, but that's the symbolism we use for the inverse. And we started using that a little. This is the inverse of what I was looking for. That's the function with domain r and range 3. The domain of range 5. Remember we said the x's became the y's, the y's became the x's. So we talked about this a little bit when we were dealing with y equals e to the x and y equals the natural log of x. These are inverses of each other. So if you don't understand one, just think, hey, this is the inverse of the one and the And I'd swap those domain and range pieces out. So f inverse of b equals a, if and only if, to start with, f of a could equal b. Ask to swap those two out. And yeah, I've been using a and b, but b is something to x and y. So <coughs> switching positions. So now what we want to do is find an inverse function algebraically. Always two basic steps, not very hard to remember. Switch the x and the y and solve for y. Now, that second one kind of opens a whole can of worms. How do you know how to solve for y? Depends on what kind of equation you are. Right? You just you do what you need to do. If it's linear, you just solve for y. But if you have something with a squared in it, we're going to end up taking square roots. If we have something cubed, we're going to take cube roots. So it's one of those things where we just generically say solve for y because we've learned enough about that that we know how to get y by itself. So this one says we're going to find an inverse function algebraically. Find an equation for the inverse of x if f of x equals x over x plus 1. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that notation f of x because that's the output. Remember, that is just fancy notation that we use to say that something is a function, but it's really the output, so it's really y. And then our two basic steps are switch the x's and the y's. Got a problem. Our two y's are on the same side, but uh, one of them's in the denominator, and we just we can't have what we're trying to solve for in the denominator. It doesn't work. So the first thing we would do is probably slap a one under here and do a little cross multiplying. Because really, it's pretty good at cross multiplying. So x times the quantity y plus one equals y. Now it's pretty normal to look at that and say, oh, I should distribute that. So yeah, let's distribute. solve for y, I need to get the y's on the same side. So how can I do that? Subtract the xy, exactly. Let's subtract the xy from both sides. So my next job will be to separate the y from the other things, the other terms that I have over here, the coefficients, which in this case would be an x. So how could we separate this y out of this? Backwards, yeah, the distributive property backwards, which is factoring. Very, very close. We need to get rid of the one on this side. Divide by it. And that would be 
to almost all points. So then we just keep that. So it's no detail when I miss the little points. What's the little detail in the directions that I'm going to use to get there? Half the work of what I see to get there. Six axes. So we go through all of this. We've done all the math. Everything's looking good. But now we have to make sure that we label this correctly. It was the inverse of the x function that we had so earlier. So why is this one here? Who got that up there? It's probably one of the, I know it was, one of the tougher type of problems that we were going to have to do because it required the factor to get rid of one. Um, but now we can add it. It probably doesn't seem that bad. You know? A lot of applied geometry application. So this is finding an inverse function graphically. We already talked about this. You don't necessarily worry too much about, you know, it's a reflection on the y hat of this x. You just switch the x's and the y's out. Find some good points and switch the x's and y's. So the points a b and b a in the coordinate plane are symmetric with respect to the line y plus x. Those points are reflections of each other across the line y plus x. Y between the x's and x between the y's. Find some good points, move them over, and you will automatically have made this a reflection of the line y plus x. See what happens? So, example five says finding an inverse function graphically. The graph of the function y equals f of x is shown in this figure, and it's just got the arrows on it. Right there. Sketch a graph of the function y equals the inverse. Is it a one-to-one -one function? Okay, well, let's deal with this in pieces. Sketch a graph of that function, of the inverse function. Alrighty, so here's what I would do. I would stop and find some right points on this graph. And it looks like negative 2, negative 4 is a pretty good one. Another good one will be right here at negative 1, 0. Another good one right here at 0, 1. And then 2, 4 is probably a pretty good bet there. That's quite a bit short of that, isn't it? Probably about 2, 6 or so. But all I have to do is reverse the order of this to get a sketch of it over here. So instead of negative 2, negative 4, it would be negative 4, negative 2. Right there. Instead of negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Instead of 0, 1, 1, 0. And instead of 2, 6, 6, 2. What we've done is we've said, all right, we've got this line y equals x. Reflect it over that line, so go equal but opposite. So this would be about right there or so. This one would be right here. And this one's not going to go anywhere. And that one would be about there. more thinking about how reflections work to get there. So much easier to just pull off some nice points off of your graph and then reverse the x's and the y's. So question, let me get my green graph off of here and have a sanity. Is this a function? Yes? Well look at that one. Look at this one. Is its inverse supposed to be a function? So the question they asked us was, is this one to one? Is it a reflection? Yeah, that's what one to one means. The original is and the inverse is. Yes, it is one, two, one. So it's actually a special function. Right? Not only is the original a function, it's inverse to the function. They get one to one. So the x would be one to one, the y would be one to x. Or is it 
the inverse is algebraic, this is fine. Um, because it uses composition that we had in the past, so there's some really good ruling here. But this process is just so smooth and seamless. And I love it when math just works out perfect and comes together. So the inverse composition rule says a function is one to one with inverse function g with one to one. You do f of g of x. And you go through all the math, and your answer is x. That's all that's left. You do f and g of x, and your answer is g twice. That's it. And if you do g of f of x, and you get g twice. That's it. So if we do composition, f of g of x and g of f of x, and we get x both times, we have proven that we have a one to one function. So as it says, for every x for every x in the domain of g, we get x for f of g of x. And x for every x in the domain of f, g of f of x. And that's because remember we talked about how the domains are based on what's an input. So for this one, the g of x is an input. For this one, f of x is an input. So that's why that's there. But don't worry too much about that. What we want to do is show that this stuff works. So it says, show algebraically that f of x equals x cubed plus 1, and g of x equals the cube g of x minus 1 or inverse function. So we're going to have to do f of g of x and make sure we get x. And we're also going to have to do g of f of x and make sure we get x. So composition tells us wherever we see an x in the Place it with that entire function g of x. Now, man, are you telling me I gotta take this whole thing and put it right there? Yes, I do. I do do it. So this will be the cube root of x minus one cubed plus one. Well, what do you know about cube root and cubing? They're inverses of each other. So what's x minus one plus one? It's smooth. I love how it's seamless. Everything just rolls along. Well, let's see it backwards. Maybe this will look a little more complicated here. So now we have to take this entire function and put it right there. Okay. So this will be the cubed root of x cubed plus 1 minus 1. What's the cube root of x to the third? It's x. We just proved that this is a one to one function. Again, just a nice smooth process. If it's not, you should say to yourself, you know, if you don't catch those inverses or the ring theory, I must have messed this up. Either that or it's not one to one. This is how we prove that it's one to one. We show f of g of x gives you x and g of f of x gives you But sometimes it is that it's not actually one to one. So we've got g of x and f of x here. It says let g of x be the inverse of negative 2 cubed roots of x minus 1 minus 5. And we're going to go through this process and figure out what it is. So the first step would be find which is the inverse. How do we do that again? the x and the y. All right, well, let's make this y. Switching the x and the y. Ooh, this idea of what the x by itself. So we're supposed to get y by itself now. What do you want to do first? Add the 5. Monster by negative two. Okay. Keep both sides. That's good. Add it. Add 
the one. <clears throat> Now there'd be one step here that I think does make this a little bit simpler, and that's because when we look at this, we realize, well, we distribute the power of three to both of these, so this would be x plus five cubed over negative eight. So that's a little bit of simplifying that we could do, but besides that, I really just wrap it up. And that would be our inverse. Now, what did they want us to name this? This is g, which is kind of weird should be calling it the inverse, but uh, we said name it G. So there it is. There's G of X. All right. There's our inverse. Back up to what they want us to do. Find G of X. Alright, so we're supposed to take that fabulous new G, and I better just rewrite this again. Alright, we're going to take this with G of X, and wherever we see an X, going to replace it with f of x. Ooh, this is going to get interesting. Let's see. That would be in place of x, negative 2 cubed of x minus 1 minus 5 plus 5. What do you notice first about our parentheses up there? Ah, negative 5 and plus 5, gone. What do we do now? We've got a cube root and a cube. So this will be negative 8 times x minus 1 if we cube all of that. Looks like that. Now what do you notice? The negative 8s are gone. Now, we should be sure that we did the inverse right because we haven't checked the book. That was g of f of x. Now we need to do f of g of x. And I think that was c. Yeah, there it is. So the last one up here is absolutely making sure this is one to one. But we're going to do f of Alrighty, so I better write what they were then. We had f of x. And that's negative 2 roots x minus 1 plus 5. And we found g of x to be x plus 1, x plus 5. Alright, so for f of g of x, which one's the one and which one? So we gotta put this big monster under here. That's what we have to do. So negative 2 cube roots x plus 5 cubed negative 8 plus 1. Minus 
this one up there. Away we go, right? What do you see? What's up there? Plus one, minus one. Gone. Next, okay. So cube root this is going to be x plus 5, cube root negative 2, negative 3 is gone, x plus 5 minus 5 equals. Was that a little tougher than the example we did before? Yeah, a lot more steps in it. But in the end, if we feel all the way through, yes, something's canceling, now something's canceling again, something's canceling again. We have that feeling like things are going the same place they're supposed to go. I'm just supposed to get an X when I'm done. You know what? We did the inverse correctly. This would not have worked. I'm sure you're thinking that's a lot of steps, but those are a lot of fun. When you do composition with both directions, they have to. All right, last thing that we're probably not looking forward to is our objective about restricting those domains. But one of the things we also wanted to do was talk about. When we have to restrict the domains. So we often need to study the inverse of a function that is not one to one. We have to do some calculus with it. To do this, we simply need to restrict the domain and look at only part of the original function. Remember, I talked yesterday about how if we see what the function is defined at implicitly, math that sometimes we can't do on the whole function we can do in the derivative of these things. And that's the same type of thing we're talking about. So it says, consider the graph of y equals x squared and its inverse. We looked at this right away when we started the book. This is not one to one. It's not. This is not going to pass the horizontal line. So its inverse is not going to be a function. But what if we really need to change that? Can we make it work? And the answer is absolutely. You could say, let's just study the positive side. Let's just take this graph at x greater than or equal to 0. Because if we do the inverse for that, we get the top portion of this graph, which by itself would be a function. So restricting those domains is something we do so that we can actually do the math on the pieces that we see. So right here, you can see x is greater than or equal to 0 written in interval notation. So just this piece, and that, of course, as I just showed you, would be the top portion of our inverse up here. Not the whole thing, because this is not one to one, this is one to one. We just do the top portion. And if you've seen that somewhere before, well, wait a second, let me add the arrows here. You know, we've seen that. This was y equals x squared. What, where is this one coming from? Yeah, that's our basic function of square root. Y equals the square root of x. So again, you know, you see, we can, if we want to study the four basic functions, sometimes we're going to have to restrict the domain and say, go with the whole thing, just look at this piece of it. Now I can do the math that I need to because this piece will be one to one. So it says, in summary, how to find an inverse function algebraically. Given a formula for a function f, proceed as follows to find its inverse. Determine that there is an inverse by checking with our horizontal line test. So check in and see that f is one to one. State any restrictions on the domain of f that you need, like this last one. It may be necessary to impose some restrictions on the domain in order to get a one to one ratio of that function. And then step two, switch the x and the y. 
step three? Solve for y. So all the way through this, blah, 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 blah. And like it says, solve for y to get the formula y equals the inverse and state any restrictions on the domain for the inverse. So let's see. Here's what they're saying. With this one, the domain went from 0 to infinity. Y value. So this one would go from 0 to infinity. Well, it just happened with this one. We've got the same domain as we do range, but these two will swap for the domain in range. So that's where we have the x and the y and the y and the x is. So in this case, it's kind of silly because they're both going to be exactly same. But in the next one that we're going to look at, we need to think about that. And what do I know about the domain and range to start with? That way I can split that and make the domain range and then use the domain for my inverse function. So down here it says show that f of x equals the square root of x plus 3 has an inverse function and find the rule for that inverse function. State any restrictions on the domain that we need to make this so first things first, how do we get that inverse? So let's make this y. And then I'll switch the x and y. Oops, that's not right. How do we solve that for y? Yeah, we have to square both sides. We can't even gain access to the y as long as that square root is there. So that means we're squaring. <laughs> and we have a problem. Here's our parent function, x squared. What does this minus 3 mean when we do it at transformation? Round 3. Is the inverse of that going to be a function? So we have to figure out how to get just one portion of this that's going to work by restricting the domain. This is an f of x. So let's just use the right position. What would our domain be? So that was our inverse function right there. And like it says, we would support this graphically. Let's see if we can answer the reason we can. Um, f of x equals the square root of x plus 3 has the inverse function, so we've got to relabel that. A little x squared minus 3. State any restrictions on the domains of f and f inverse. Well, we did the restrictions on the domain for the inverse. So now, if we want to do the restrictions on the domain for the original, oops, and I put that on there, and that should be that inverse. There. Because we already found the roots, all we have to do is the roots. They use F an awful lot, but um, G, H, F, G, N, H kind of means all the things. So if these were our domain and range for our inverse piece here, then this becomes our domain of the original. And the domain of our inverse becomes the range of the original. Now usually we do that backwards. Usually we find the domain and range of the original, and then we flip it to get the inverse. 
makes perfect sense when you look at this. Hey, new domain starting here at name three. So I need your four three two one zero. And I'm just going to ask overall about tables. numbers. Good, good, good. And this section is just a one-day section. We're not used to that, but it's one day. But mostly 